So uh, our next uh, our next uh, panel, um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Tracy Coates from uh, who is a colleague here at the University of Ottawa, in the is it the school or the institute 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 of Canadian and Aboriginal Studies here at the university, um, and uh, I very much appreciate Tracy uh, filling in uh, fairly late in, in the organizing of, of this panel and to chair this next panel. Tracy. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome you all. Um, the last panel was very interesting and I'm sure the next one is going to be equally so. We're going to be doing a slightly different format uh, from some of the other panels because we have a unique presentation first by Brenda, Brenda McDougall and Mike Evans. Um, they're going to be presenting on... Oh, <laughs> uh, a Sorry. digital archive we're building. A digital archive they're building. My apologies. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, and they're looking for feedback on that, but we're going to hold the feedback until after the presentation, um, and you're welcome to get in touch with them about that afterwards. So I'm going to start by introducing um, Mike Evans and Brenda McDougall. Brenda is, I just need to find my little notes here. She was appointed cha the chair of Métis Research at the University of Ottawa in 2010 after working for ten year, over 10 years at the Department of Native Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. She holds a PhD in Native Studies and has been researching the history of various Métis communities in Ottawa, uh, sorry, in Ontario, Manitoba, North Dakota, Saskatchewan, Montana, and Alberta for many years. Her first book, One of the Family, Métis Culture in the 19th Century Northwestern Saskatchewan, won the Clio Prize for Best Book in Western Canada in 2011. And Professor Mike Evans is from the UBC Okanagan campus, and he will be coming down to join us, I think. He's tall, he's over there. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, we changed things up a little bit, and I just know, need to know how to get this on the screen. No. Which button? Perfect. All right. Um, so we are going to um, discuss um, uh, how we've been working in the digital humanities. And our partners in this are um, Nicole St. Ange at the Institute of Canadian and Aboriginal Studies and Chris Anderson from the University of Alberta, who we'll be speaking later. Um, and really, we're, we were trying to figure out new ways to tell um, some of our older stories. And I'm not going to dwell a lot on this. People have been talking about it. But We've been caught up for a long time in this uh, big M, small M, Métis debate. Are we a nation? Is it race? Um, uh, Dr. Chartrand last night spoke very eloquently on the problem, but this issue of being um, mixed bloods. We have a lot of organizations that have uh, evolved in the last, um, since 2003 really, um, who emphasized mixed bloodedness as the key uh, identity marker. And then we have the Métis National Council, which has existed since 1983, although its history is much older, but as the, the current uh, name of the Métis National Council since 1983, has always been emphasizing ancestral connections to communi community, um, representing historic Métis nation, <coughs> historic Métis nation ancestry, distinct, all of these kinds of uh, language. And from both perspectives, this idea of mixed-bloodedness or nationhood has um, really impacted uh, the manner in which courts have been um, dealing or trying to address these issues in the last little while. We've heard a lot about the Pali decision in the last um, 12 hours, um, which really um, did emphasize mixed ancestry but recognizable groups of identities separate from. And then now we're waiting for the outcome, of, of course, of the Daniels decision um, and whether or not Métis are going to be recognized as constitutional Indians under Section 9124. The, from a researcher perspective, the importance of Pali is less about the definitions than about the um, uh, investment in research that has come from Aboriginal and Northern Affairs Canada. And um, Mike and I, as well as Nicole and Chris, have been um, beneficiaries of that um, research infrastructure, and we have um, been engaged in different kinds of research projects over the last um, decade, and we've been building databases, trying to 
um, deal with large volumes of historical data, whether it's um, church material, whether it's Hudson's Bay Company, Voyager records, but trying to um, wade through this uh, immense archival collection of material and put some sort of parameters to it. And so we built our databases. We use our databases individually, but we started discussing how we could bring together those databases and how we could merge them and create some sort of coherent um, digital uh, archival platform so that other people could access the same archival resources. Because one of the, the issues about archival research is if you're, not, if you're not used to it, if you're not trained in it, it's incredibly difficult. Um, it's often intimidating and daunting to walk into Library and Archives Canada. It's not a library. They can't just you know, pull something off the shelf and help you. You actually have to sift through all of this material. And locating data is one of the hardest things. So we actually, the databases we've created individually represent probably about 44 different archival collections spread across 20 or 30 different archival repositories. So we're hoping to create a digital interface that allows us to link um, and to work with that material more effectively for ourselves, but also make it uh, publicly available to other people. So we're trying to leverage technology um, to address these older debates. Um, and, and we use, all of us use various kinds of um, different sorts of archival documents, different sorts of repositories. I'm a big user of church records, um, but there's also census material, there's fur trade records. Um, and, you know, hearkening back to uh, Dr. Kimmel earlier, actually in the 1970s trying to find that more recent material is much, much harder than it is to find the 19th century da data. We don't have anything out of the 19th century, by the way. We are, uh, we are 19th century nerds um, so far. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a possibility to add um, co more contemporary material from the 20th century as people collect it. And so I'm going to turn this over to Mike because um, I'm technologically inept. I couldn't even get the PowerPoint on, so this is his gear. So uh, thanks uh, very much, Brenda. So um, let me uh, just start by reiterating a couple of the points that Brenda's just made, not because I think you can't remember what they are, but because it helps me orient to what this is. Um, a lot of the database work that has been done over the last decade or so um, is sitting on platforms of different sorts. Um, and uh, any of you who have worked in this uh, space uh, and know very well that um, technology is constantly changing and keeping up with it is a problematic. And I don't mean problematic in the sense of, oh, geez, I can't get my internet to work or I can't get my uh, email to work properly. I mean, we can't get that database that was produced 15 years ago to run because it was built on a, 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 on a platform in a language which is no longer current and no longer supported by the IT uh, services of the university, let alone the IT services of the uh, provincial or national Métis organization uh, where it is now housed. And so this project and this discussion uh, really arises from some concerns uh, very, some very specific concerns regarding specific databases, but also a kind of general concern to keep the databases current. There's a kind of requirement for the kind of constant revolution uh, in this material in order to keep it accessible. So uh, fundamentally what this database project was about was uh, retooling some of the existing databases, putting some new databases into play, and then trying to figure out how to link them. And so underlying this concern for sustainability in this project is also a concern for making high-level data linkages possible. Because that's not something that we do very well at all. Uh, and it's something we, we, we need to get a little bit better at. And, and indeed, it's, it's probably the most innovative thing about what we're trying to do here. I want to caution uh, before I start uh, as well. And I know that the Australians have got this wonderful saying. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not trying to teach your grandmother how to suck eggs. Uh, and, and, and it means, <laughs> it means, I know you know this, I'm not trying to be patronizing, uh, even though I may be uh, a little bit patronizing here, and, I, and, and I'm just saying this because it needs to be said. 
because uh, it's a really important it's a really important point. So even though I know that you know this, I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, these databases do not the Métis Nation make. They do not the Métis Nation of Mon Montana make. They do not the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan make. They do not the Métis National Council make. These databases are databases, and they are not in and of themselves a claim to anything. That, by the way, includes script-based databases, which are not uh, exclusively, uh, do not exclusively contain uh, Métis people by any definition. Uh, and so um, the point here is not that these databases uh, um, uh, are exactly contiguous with the Métis Nation. They simply add something to the conversation about what and how Métis can be understood. Okay? So with that proviso, uh, let me start. So um, uh, fundamentally, uh, this database is meant to be accessible and it's meant to be usable. Underlying this is like that kind of uh, a federally funded research should be available to the Canadian public. There's something about that there. And so um, you can log, and any of you who are, who are uh, like connected right now can log in uh, uh, via um, a fairly simple and straightforward uh, mechanism. And there it is. Okay, so uh, uh, you see there that, that the, uh, the cosc304.ok.ubc.ca slash Métis slash. Okay. I want to interrupt for just one second. This is not, uh, we haven't launched this yet. You're actually seeing the first um, beta version of the prototype. We won't launch for another eight months or so. That's right. And indeed, one of the things we're doing here is asking you to actually have a look at it and provide some feedback. Uh, on it, because we're very much interested in, in uh, uh, how it might be improved and how it might be more useful uh, to people uh, generally. So um, uh, here you see the, the, uh, the front page of it. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to go into it if you wanted to. Oh. Sorry. Just wanted you to, to see how easy it is. This is on a, actually a, an instructional server at UBC, and it's fast. It's really fast. So uh, if you want to go in it and have a look at it, you can. Um, in that database, uh, uh, or in this, uh, on this platform, are all kinds of databases, um, specifically a whole series of sacramental uh, uh, records coming out of uh, uh, Brenda and Nicole's work, and a bunch of BC uh, fur trade-related records uh, coming out of work that we did uh, with MNBC a number of years ago. If you go to the summary page, any of you who are on the net having a look at the database, if you go to the summary page, you will see a description uh, of, the, uh, of the databases. Uh, there are, uh, as I say, uh, several of them. And when you get to the search page, by, which you will do simply by clicking search, again, it's pretty simple, straightforward interface, but it's intended to be simple and straightforward, um, you can uh, simply search anything. Uh, here you can see, and I hope you can read, that what I've searched here is the, the uh, surname Arcand. And you'll see that it, it actually brings up two tabs, one institutional registries, which are the sacramental uh, records, and then the other lives lived west. That's lives lived west of the divide by Bruce Watson. There's a, a database which has basically all of the fur traders and their families who came west of the Rockies uh, prior to 1858 with some of the, the work we did uh, uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. If you go into those ARCANs, <clears throat> uh, you will find uh, 62 of them in the institutional record, record and, and one is Felicite Ar ARCAN, and I'm sure that I just butchered the pronunciation of that uh, with apologies. And um, uh, uh, here uh, you will see, in fact, uh, in the record that, that there are three uh, people of the same name in the list of ARCANs uh, on the site. And uh, I want to draw your attention to um, a very important feature of the site, and that is the similar person suggestions up in the right-hand corner there. So here we've got uh, seven different databases, all of which are focused around individuals. All of the field or all of the uh, the records within the uh, databases are focused on individuals. Many of them are the same people, but we don't know that they're the same people. There's no mechanical 
or computer-based way of establishing that they're the same people. And all th those of you who are doing genealogies know very well that names appear over and over again, generation after generation, many different families. Often it's very difficult to figure out who is which uh, John Arkan, for example. And uh, this uh, a uh, similar suggestion tab is intended to provide an opportunity for users to suggest linkages between uh, individuals, i.e. that the individuals are the same. So if you click on this, the uh, uh, similar suge uh, person suggestions, uh, you will get uh, 10 different people who may be, may be the same person. <clears throat> And uh, you can, in fact, using the interface as an administrator, uh, link the records, which basically merges records across databases. Now, that might sound like a small thing, but it's actually a huge thing. Because what it allows now is for someone, someone, <laughs> maybe one of you, uh, to link across these databases and actually recreate a single individual across, across a series of databases, which because the databases include things like family linkages, i.e. Uh, the uh, uh, parents, uh, uh, witnesses at baptisms, that sort of stuff, all of this data can be linked in, into one single record. Okay? And, and basically, uh, what we require here is God to come down <laughs> and decide whether and how a particular linkage is, uh, is, is verifiable and historically accurate. Okay? So the programming will allow a systematic kind of set of algorithms to suggest linkages, and what's required now is for someone, some entity, some institution, some uh, uh, something uh, to uh, actually uh, systematically uh, establish that the linkages are in place. Uh, here's another um, another uh, search. Uh, this one, uh, 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 Sinclair, um, and you see here there's 181 uh, institutional registry entries and 10 entries uh, of uh, fur traders in lives lived west of the divide. Uh, and here's the, here's that interface uh, uh, for records from lives lives lived west of the divide. Uh, uh, again, basically these are fur trade records. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and include a whole, whole variety of very detailed information of those who you've seen the uh, historical biography by uh, um, Watson. Uh, this is exactly what, what we actually did is created the database and then generated the three volume set out of the database. So they're exactly uh, um, the same. Now, um, uh, if you spend some time with the database, um, and I would like to encourage you to spend some time with the database, we'd really appreciate uh, feedback on its usability and uh, feasibility. Um, the, the other thing that we're uh, thinking about right now and, and worrying about right now is sustainability. One of the reasons, again, that this project was launched was in order to actually um, well, to save a couple of the BC databases because they were on unstable platforms. They were basically on platforms that got uh, um, enclosed through a particular mechanism uh, using um, a, a licensing uh, for softwares that had been open and then got closed down. Um, uh, but there's, a, there's, a, there's another a kind of issue about sustainability, uh, and that is institutional sustainability. We all know that uh, things change, and th sometimes in Métis politics, things change really quickly, uh, and institutions can uh, can, can go into dark times, uh, although they generally emerge, but they, they can in fact go into dark times. And one of the good things about university partnerships is that they're a little bit more stable, at least the libraries are, uh, and, uh, and the servers are. And, and so these the relationships with universities are one of the places where uh, 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 records can go uh, uh, and be safe, if you like, for the longer term. Um, and uh, the other thing we're looking for is a partnership uh, which is able to actually start to make the historical determinations that are required to link these individual records as well. So there's the mechanical problem, and then there's the, uh, then there's the intellectual problem. I th we think we've got a pretty good handle on the mechanical problems. The intellectual problems remain. Uh, and that's actually about institutional relationships as well. 
and uh, I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, take feedback, no. Not right now. Um, we're going to have the other uh, two speakers, but we are available. We're here all day. Um, we're certainly here with lunch with you. We'll certainly be around later in the evening and tomorrow. So if you want to pull any one of us aside, please do. We're happy to take suggestions, feedback. If you know of a database that you think should be added in, we're happy to have that conversation too. Um, we did build it in such a way that, well, I say we, I didn't. Um, somebody built this in such a way that we should be effectively able to merge things based on names. So the name is the key criteria um, because this is about individuals. You can't build collectivities until you know who's at the root. Um, and so that's where we start from. Can you put the uh, website link up on the screen again? Great. Thank you both very much. So the digital archive that uh, Brenda McDougall and Mike Evans have presented, it seems like a fantastic database for providing an important approach to making records available and accessible to the public. And I'm sure they'll all appreciate your, your feedback on that. It also looks like a great way to allow users to participate in the development of the research. Yeah. And uh, I noticed that there's already over 100,000 records in there, which is quite an accomplishment. That's fantastic. So I look forward to the formal launch in eight months, as well as I'm sure everyone else does. Um, and uh, this certainly ties in with the theme of our our uh, panel today, which is Mapping Narratives of Métisness and Community. So thank you very much for that, Brenda. So our next guest today, um, unfortunately Jennifer Adise, who is going to be presenting on Métis, we're clearly in the Northwest, narrating Métisness in constitutional debates and abuse misuse of Section 35. Unfortunately, so it does sound good, doesn't it? But unfortunately she was not able to join us. Um, but we're very fortunate to have with us right now Robert Innes, who is uh, filling in at the last minute, so thank you very much for that. He's an assistant professor in Indigenous Studies at the University of U of S. Um, he's a member, a band member of the Kawases First Nation. Did I say that right? Close enough? Okay. <laughs> um, he's the author of Elder Brothers and the Law of the People, and he has a new book coming out um, called Indigenous Men and Masculinities, which is co-edited with Kim Anderson. So I'd like you all to join me in welcoming uh, Rob Innes with us today. Probably Wherever, you can even sit there, probably. If you want. Okay. I get, I get, I get these. So. <laughs> I think those are mine, actually. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, first acknowledge being on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Larry Chartrand and and Darren O'Toole for inviting me here uh, a couple days ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so you, I looked at the title of the panel, uh, narrat uh, map Narratives or Mapping Narratives of Maintenance and Communities, and I thought, well, I don't know what that means, but, um, <laughs> but I thought, but you know, um, what I thought I would do was talk about uh, and, and sort of kind of picking up on uh, actually what Tony Belcourt was talking about in his comments. And uh, what I really want to think about uh, uh, is the reconciling uh, the histories of the relationships between First Nations people and the Métis. And this is something I've been really thinking about really deeply for the last 10, 12 hours and uh, <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> uh, well actually you know th this was part of my um, a, a part of this or aspect of this was was a part of my dissertation research in which and I, I know there might have been how many people were at that fabulous talk yesterday afternoon <laughs> Okay, well, good. Oh, not, uh, uh, um, I gave that talk. And, <laughs> anyway, so uh, um, that's good. There's not very many people here, so there's going to be some overlap between what I talked about yesterday, but, but not much. Uh, 
at any rate, you know, my, my, my dissertation research, I, I explored the um, uh, contemporary kinship patterns and practices of uh, people from my reserve, Kaosas. And um, in, in short, you know, the Kaosas was a mixed band. And, and like most of the bands in Southern Saskatchewan, they're mixed bands. My, my reserve is, uh, comprises of uh, Plains Cree, Assiniboine, Soto, Métis and half-breeds. Oh, those are the majority of people of the band, the majority, although there were individuals from other groups like the Gravant and Dakota and, and so on. And so what I was thinking, what I, when, I, when I was uh, entered into the research, I was thinking, why is it that, that this is a mixed band? How could this be a mixed band when we are usually told in the anthropological and historical records that these bands in, in Saskatchewan were distinctly bounded tribes, Plains Cree? Assiniboine. That's the history that we're given. We're given histories of the Plains Cree, history of the Assiniboine, history of Soto or Ojibwe, and history of the Métis. And, and here we have all these bands that are culturally mixed. They have multicultural uh, components to it. And, and, uh, but what was, what was uh, uh, one of the things that was, was really interesting to me was, well, wait a second. The pre-reserve band had uh, Métis and half-breeds in it. Well, how could that be? Métis people are said to be, and the story that we're given is that they are racially and culturally distinct from First Nations people. And yet, here they are in my band, but not just my band, they're in, uh, in almost every band in Southern Saskatchewan and into Montana and North Dakota. So how could that be? If the, how could that, and I think that this is something that uh, isn't really, um, uh, acknowledge that the, the cultural similarity, we, we, what is acknowledged is the cultural difference, but not really the cultural similarities of First Nation and Métis people. M Métis people were part of Kaos's because they shared the similar culture, uh, kinship practices and protocols. And, and this comes up a lot, it came up a lot in my, when I was uh, um, doing some of the research uh, uh, in, for, my, for my dissertation. Uh, you know, for example, uh, it, um, one of the prominent families on Kaos's is Lara. That's a fam prominent, one of the prominent family names. Lara, spelled, I mean, spelled Larat, right? But it's Lara. And um, um, he, in Lara, the, the original, I can't remember what his first name was, but, and he had a, a Soto name as well. But anyway, so Lara came up to uh, Cypress Hills in the late 1870s. And he came up from Turtle Mountain. And he came up with a band, and he was referred to by the uh, fur traders in, in, in Cypress Hills as the chief of the half-breeds. So he came up with, uh, with his Métis uh, uh, band, and he went around Cypress Hills. And at that time, there's between three and 5,000 uh, First Nations people and Métis people at the, located in Cypress Hills. And he went from different places, different bands, and he was trying to uh, you know, see if he could join up with a band and uh, Kaos's, Chief Kaos's, uh welcomed him into his band. So, and and uh, that was one of, one of the ways that, that uh, um, the Métis became in, came into our band. But that wasn't the only way, because uh, as it happens, that there were a lot of intermarrying marriages between uh, people from Kaos's and people from uh, various uh, Métis communities uh, in the, in the uh, early reserve period, there was a number of people who would, um, during uh, the, the, when they were getting their annuities, uh, they decided that they would take script instead. So there are band members who decided they would take script instead. And uh, of course, you know, uh, there were other, when, when during the treaty negotiations, there were uh, many of the chiefs uh, really were adamant and, and they, uh, they, were, they wanted the government to, to negotiate treaties with the Métis. They, uh, in Treaty 4, Kaosis, um, um, in Treaty 6, uh, Little, uh, 
um, Little Pine and Mr. Wasson, they all were telling that, that they all they were saying that the government should treat with the with the with the Métis. When the government didn't, the many of the Métis people just just joined bands that the relatives were in, and 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 so when people think say think, think of that today, when people today think that a lot of people think it, it, think of it. In, in today's context, well, yeah, we're related to the to the to to First Nations people, or we're related to Indian people from generations back. We're like, you know, five, six, eight generations ago, we were related to the Métis, we were related to the First Nations people. That may be true. I mean, it's certainly that that the intermarriage and, and kept on has kept on going through right up to present. But back in the 1870s, these weren't. Eight generations uh, related. These these were cousins and brothers and siblings or or uh, uncles. That that they were that closely related. They weren't like distantly related. They were intimately related or closely related. And so so you had some you had Métis people join join up with um, um, the relatives and, and settled on reserve. And today, now they're now those people, those Métis people, are staunch First Nation advocates, right? And meanwhile, you had some 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 of the Indians who said, "Well, I don't really want to be confined to the reserve, so I'm going to go and take scrip." And so some of those Indians are now staunch Métis today, right? They're like heavy duty staunch Métis, right? <laughs> you know, they'll 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 be eating. I mean, they'll be jigging as hard as they can, no matter what, right? <laughs> And, and, but you know what was interesting is that um, you know there were some of these people who took script, some of the people from uh, from Kalsos who took script, but then later decided well you know they they um, they they'd rather be back on the reserve, so they actually went back and 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 became went to the reserve. What the Indian Affairs did and what the Indian agents did is that they withheld. So uh, there was one case where uh, this one man married a Métis woman and uh, they, he took script and then they decided to go back onto the reserve. So what they did is they, they withheld his annuity and the annuities of his, his wife and his, his children until they had paid back the you know whatever it was one hundred and sixty dollars that you know and so for five dollars you know it took a little while right to pay back the hundred six but anyways they actually went back to back onto the reserve and back and they were accepted back in, in, in so there must have been that little bit of window right that because I because I can't really I haven't really found anywhere where this is legal right they could legally do this but uh, in some way somehow people were were doing that and I, mean, I don't know if this was up to the discretion of individuals Indian agents, but nonetheless, they they went back, right? And and certainly uh, another in, in other cases were uh, in the uh, early reserve period, about the 1880s or so. There was about seven families: the Desjardins family, the Delorme, and Pelche families. Uh, seven seven those uh, those families and seven of those families went down to Turn Mountain because there were the Turn Mountain and Cowses. They were heavily uh, Interrelated, so they went down there to live with them. But in the 18 um, early 1880s, um, there was uh, th when Turner Mountain was was uh, was uh, was looking for and uh, petitioning for federal recognition through the United States. They came to Louis Osoup, who was the uh, the chief at the time. He was uh, Chief Cowles's headman during. During the treaty negotiations, he came up to uh, he came up and they asked uh, Louis Soup to help uh, advocate for them to go to Washington, and and they were able to do this because the uh, the way in which uh, Louis Soup who who had, who was Métis and Soto uh, and and the people he was dealing with on the um, uh, dealing with on Turner Mountain were also. Métis and Soto, so they were they were they were closely related through language, blood, and culture, and they were going to go down to to Washington to advocate for for Turner Mountain, and they were going to and he was going to bring uh, some of the Turner Mountain people with him to Ottawa because he wanted to go to Ottawa to. Um, 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 
to put forth some grievances towards Ottawa. So there was a lot of these uh, 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 examples. Another example, uh, you know, during 1885, Leo Soup had written a letter to Louis Riel saying that uh, um, um, that he was going to send send people up to Patash and that the the, the Calus was uh, was going to um, uh, support Riel and was going to send send people up. Uh, he was talking about them being re uh, relatives, and that uh, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending on, uh, on <laughs> how, you, how you want to see it playing out. But anyway, the, the, some of the counselors uh, were were leery about that, so they kind of persuaded uh, Leo uh, Osup to not uh, to not partake in 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 the in the uh, activities up in in Patash. But nonetheless, there were uh, at least one of the uh, one of the uh, participants in, in Batash came down to, uh, to and settled on Kalos's after 1885. And so the, the, the relationship between uh, First Nations and, and, or at least the Korean, the Soto, and the Assiniboine uh, of Kalos's and the Metis uh, uh, and, and half-breeds was, was uh, long-standing prior to the, to the reserve time and in, in the early reserve period. And even into the 20th century, the, the, that, ma that relationship was maintained. The, the, the town of Merivale, uh, or village of Merivale, which was uh, the, the Métis community that was just across the river from, from uh, Kaos's, was um, uh, heavily integrated into the reserve, uh, uh, socially through you know, dances, uh, um, baseball, P people would play baseball together on the same team, go to dances, they went to the same church, the church which was located, the Catholic church was located on the reserve, so that's where, that's where everyone went to for, for their, um, for for the church, and they uh, continued to intermarry. In fact, uh, when I was doing my master's research, my master's research, I was looking at the uh, uh, influence of First Nation and Métis veterans in the post-war era from 1945 to 1960. I interviewed uh, um, one Métis veteran from from Maryville, from that area, and. Uh, what I found is that his wife was, um, who was, um, was a Bill C-31 member of the band. She was from Kaos's. She had married, uh, married the, the veteran, uh, lost her status, and gained her status. And so then went and lived on the, on in the Métis community, in the Métis community. But what the, the other thing, what, what was interesting was, I mean, that was interesting too, but, but what, the other thing that was interesting is that he too was a Bill C-31 Kaos's band member because his mom was from Kaos's. And so, but he was raised in the Métis community because his father was Métis and, and his mom was from Kaos's. So, I mean, so that intermarriage and interrelationship between Kaos's and, and, and the Métis community and Maryville continued right into the 20th century. And even um, uh, to today, there are the, there is a connection between um, the um, Métis from Maryville in Regina and, and the Kaos people in Regina. There's about a thousand band members living in Kaos. I mean, living in Regina from Kaos, and they have uh, and they have maintained those relationships with the Maryville Metis. I should say, 100 percent. Some have. There have definitely some. Some of the fams have maintained those relationships, and I think that that what um, I think that. What gets lost in uh, in the historical and anthropological accounts is that you know the similarities that uh, that First Nation and Métis people have. You know, one of the points I made last yesterday in my talk was that you know the the people are, are you know they they think of Métis being racially different, right, and culturally different, but really the Métis the and, and the Plains Cree were no more different than say they make the Plains Cree and the Cinnaboyne, right? They're no more different, and, pro and they were probably more similar than right, the Métis and, and the Plains Cree are probably more similar than the Métis and the Cinnaboyne, right? But we're but we're we're used to thinking of the Métis and Cinnaboyne as Indians, and 
the Métis as Métis, not Indians, therefore must be something different than, different than, right? So, so, and I think that that tends to blur and, and really distort the, the the historic realities, but also the contemporary realities, because many as, as Métis and First Nations people of course, continue to live in, in the same neighborhoods in, in Regina and Saskatoon, same uh, same areas in in in, in the uh, in. Wow, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I made it to three minutes to go. <laughs> and so, and anyway, so I you know I just wanted to uh, uh, put it out there that I think that you know that you know time you know you know to uh, there was a time when we needed to assert. Uh, a separate identity, make sure that, you know, you know the First Nation and Métis people, you know, we had, you know, make sure that we understood that where the similarity, where, where the differences are. But I think in, uh, that, you know, uh, it, time, it's, a, it's, start, it's a good time to start thinking about reconciling our histories and reconciling the fact that we are probably more similar than we are different. And that even though we that there are different uh, colonial categories that we've been that been imposed upon us, that we have to work around with and work within in, in terms of achieving uh, uh, rights or achieving a uh, 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 better life for our people. But nonetheless, given given those realities, that that doesn't necessarily mean we have to completely ignore and pretend that that our uh, that our relations do not exist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. That was really fantastic. I'd be interested, if that's what you can come up with with 12 hours of deep thought, I'd be interested to see what you can do with 24. <laughs> So that was an important introduction into the importance of exploring and reconciling uh, cultural similarities and connections between First Nations and Métis peoples. So thank you again for that. And I'm very pleased to introduce our final guest today, which is Signa Dom Shanks. Sorry, Shanks. Okay, I was going to say it the Mohawk way. Sorry, I almost said skanks. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier, the Mohawk skanks. And anyway, okay. So Signa Dom Shanks is uh, joining us from Osgood Hall Law School, which is my alma mater. Awesome place, of course, Ottawa U being fantastic as well. Um, <laughs> Full-time full faculty, uh, she's been a full-time faculty member there since 2014. Before that, she was at the University of Saskatchewan College of Law, where she has been, had been a an assistant professor. Prior to that time at U of S, she was on the faculty at the University of Alberta's School of Native Studies and also taught regularly with the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Native Studies. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Signa Dom Skanks. Shanks. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Mohawk, just sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and she's going to be presenting on being presentist for the sake of passing on knowledge using community stories to help improve modern social relations. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, uh, it's, it's great to be here. And um, uh, the, uh, those weren't actually slips. I, I was, you know, finding out in, in meeting new friends here that I most likely have some Mohawk cousins um, that uh, were part of my uh, family's past in southern Manitoba as well, too. It's um, a real joy to be here and um, to be um, welcomed in uh, Algonquin territory. But also, um, I'd like to say welcomed by Larry. Um, uh, we bump into each other a lot via the summer program at the law school at U of S. And um, just so um, honored that he lets me be the nerd I love to be in front of him and um, ask me to sort of talk about some reflections I have about a major project. I've sort of finished one phase of it right now and sort of I'm thinking about what to do with it next. Um, so uh, I'm here to sort of talk about what this word presentist means um, for me because um, I'm trained as a, a lawyer and trained as a historian and so when I go to you know the Ontario Bar Association they say, well, um, you talk about history too much. And then when you go to the CHA, they talk about, uh, um, or I'm just thinking of Jim Miller very recently told me to stop being a lawyer when I was looking at the Rupert's Land transfer issue. And I find myself regularly deliberating with this idea of how to translate stuff. 
for different circles I'm part of. And one of the words that has sometimes come up in sort of the scholarly speak that's part of it is this idea of being presentist. Are you using modern social ideas to talk about the past? And I find myself very regularly leaning towards doing that because I'm struggling with how to introduce some ideas to a circle that might not have as much base knowledge as I wish they did. You know, and so that idea of interest, introducing stuff in a basic form that I wish I, I wish I could be more advanced about, but it's really important to respect the lack of knowledge parties might have and to be very supportive of their interest in learning. But also still trying to be, and here's the sort of historian side of it, historically accurate and respecting the, the depth and the breadth breadth, not the breast, maybe. <laughs> I haven't found any breasts in my uh, research yet. Um, but uh, the depth and the breadth of what you found and to not water it down in a way that you know, makes, makes you lean more towards Pierre Burton and uh, Peter C. Newman styles as compared to um, Jim Miller and Brenda and some other um, fabulous folks. Um, my major project is about a I, I, I had to sort of translate it into sort of geographical terms. Um, it's sort of a peninsula in um, what's now Saskatchewan. And it's another moment where I had to translate it about in sort of geographical, geological terms. It would be considered the base of the Churchill River, too, in many respects. So right away when I started getting to know about that, I had a moment of being a translator because on a lot of maps, that um, peninsula is on the edge of a lake. And so right from the beginning, I had to get used to this idea of what concepts and forms I was looking at. But I thought I'd show you, um, first of all, an image that is the one that made me think, oh my gosh, I'm really going to have to be a translator and potentially be presentist. And it's this one, that I just hit a button that I thought would go to it, and it doesn't. Do you know, is it this? What did you do to move? Oh, down? It's stuck. Yeah, you can, you can use that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so notice these are two signs in a ditch um, um, beside Highway 908 in Saskatchewan. And so when you learn that that's Highway 908, that's the province's term for it, which means that there were 907 roads in Saskatchewan, the province acknowledged before giving it that name. And, and um, this photo is valuable because um, uh, I believe it was taken in like late June. So just think of there's, you know, un even if your body oozed muscal from the day you were born, that would not be enough to keep away the bugs at that moment to make that photo work out properly there. So um, when I decided to be sort of researching this peninsula, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about constantly on my mind is how can this matter for modern times? If I'm, as a Métis person, wanting to contribute to the knowledge we have, move things forward, be responsible, constantly having that on my mind. Because as a lawyer, I like to think sometimes, sometimes we have a lot to lose if we're not too careful. And so thinking about how I study the early, early histories to modern times of this community really matter. And it really matters for some ideas that are in this ditch. That that's one sign on the right that has, as the final word, you can't see it, lands, traditional lands, beside a sign that's about conservation and how in law that idea of conservation is often talked about as a sharing idea and, and conservation, I found. It's this one that when you're translating into law, like goodness knows who's going to be brought into the topic of conservation. But it's not just one party that does it. It's based on these relations together. So if you've got an idea of traditional lands, which is coming into this idea of Aboriginal title and, well, boundaries and fence posts and all that kind of stuff. How does that merge with that idea of conservation? And what do I do as someone trained in both of these areas do when I find, and I'm going to talk about this, this theme of conservation and balance and different forces working together to continue the land's form is so fundamental to this peninsula's way of, of acting as a natural form and as the, of the peoples there acting as um, community members. 
so I wanted to first um, uh, sort of show you that visual to see sort of the moments I've been struggling with. But I also wanted to tell you about a phrase that's been constantly on my mind about what to do now and this idea of, you know, fear of being presentist. The community that, um, and well, the, the, the name of the community that's, that's on this peninsula isle across, um, I've decided to investigate in sort of, it's almost like an empirical form as well too. I've looked at absolutely all of the Hudson Bay Company records um, up until 1906 and really tried to do this sort of regression analysis kind of understanding to it. I'm trained in law and economics as well and, and we get sort of weird that way. And um, I want to tell you about a phrase I came across and it was the phrase, I must leave, our laws will not succeed. Poor Peter Fiddler at Alacross. He really stumbles and bubbles there and doesn't do as well as I think he'd like to do. He said that about that area in 1809. So when I'm trying to think about this idea of laws and how to talk to people about it in a modern forum, and also talk about this idea that if Peter Fiddler's laws are not succeeding, it's because there's other laws there as well too, functioning. What do I do? Do I work harder on trying to present those laws that are there? Or is one of the best ways to suggest the laws there are so fundamentally strong, is it important to focus on how outsiders' laws didn't work? And that that's where a good comparator can be. But again, sort of all these ideas of translating. So um, for uh, what I'd like to sort of... Uh, news about here is first of all give you some examples of how this peninsula, um, uh, particularly during the, the 19th century, I, I'm a big fan of the 18th century, but the, but the 19th century is really, really fun too in the, in the Northwest. Finding moments that are these ideas of laws, and here's what I'd like to um, sort of present to you is those moments of laws we should here's a moment of presentism, either think of them as a prequel to the idea of treaties, or alternatively, we should see those moments where local laws dominate other laws as a treaty type moment as well too. Because here's the thing about a la Crosse, is outsiders keep coming and they adapt to local ways. So to me, that suggests that those local laws have a very f strong form of sovereignty that needs to be respected in historical research, and that we can see those arrangements of outsiders deciding to shift what they do as respect for those legal norms. So regardless of whether there is a written document that we would say has an idea of nation to nation, that there's some other um, points in history that we can bring to the fore to talk to people about that, that are the ways we can see that sovereignty being really strong. Our lacrosse is really helpful for that, and I just thought I'd give you some examples now of things where you see that. Community members demand deficit budgets be run at the posts. A la Crosse was one of the only posts in Rupert's Land that had that. Locals demand that surcharges and taxes be eliminated on any of the exchanges they had with Hudson Bay Company workers. The only post in Rupert's Land that has that for that long period of time. Locals also demand that their forms of understanding criminality, family law, I'd, I'd say whether we think of it as a, an idea of nationhood at that moment, but at minimum, um, a smaller, ver uh, a sort of a local version of municipal governance be there. And that it is those ways we can see that nation to nation understanding because the um, legal system that the outsiders are wanting to implement does not quite be made. So. Um, in thinking about these ways of noticing the idea of sort of sovereignty, um, of locals being challenged, and outsiders deciding that there are so many benefits to being part of um, what's going on in the Churchill River that they decide they can put aside their own um, views and values about legal systems. 
I'd like to now sort of move on to some ideas that um, I am sort of making a bit of a to-do list for myself. And this is a, a bit of a starting point, but just starting to think of how can we make these moments better when we're acting as translators and what we're, when we're doing what I think every once in a while I'll be accused of doing, and that is presentism. Like, for example, using the phrase deficit budget about the 19th century. <laughs> CHA, there might be some people there that sort of roll their eyes at that, but that's what I found. And every once in a while I might argue, maybe we can find in Métis histories the first example of something that continues on today. It's not presentism. It just means that we have to call attention to our colleagues that they don't know enough about Métis history. So they're actually being incomplete in how they understand taxation and deficits and multiculturalism, but I'll get to that in a second. So here's sort of my to-do list for myself, and I'd love to hear anybody else's ideas of sort of their to-do list about how to work with history and how we call people's attention to these ideas, particularly when there's an issue in law. Okay, um, first of all for me is, I have to learn better how to talk to people about the difference between historic events and historical events. And that idea of people in law realizing there's something called historiography and getting better as lawyers and people talking about legal arguments in realizing that whether we think of it as literature review or we think of it as the history of how people decided to look into a topic, lawyers don't think about that enough. They really don't. And for those of us who are interested in the past, I think one of the greatest things we can do, you know, when we're talking to people about modern legal issues is to say, how's the literature review going for that subject you're interested in? And you know, and if they have a blank stare on their face, you know, <laughs> you know, again, that's a moment where we're going to be acting as translators, you know, talking about different perspectives on things. Um, one of the sort of Intimidating things I found when I was articling and then working afterwards, but didn't quite know how to articulate it because I thought I was new and I couldn't, was the reliance some lawyers had in um, uh, litigation in the prairies and the f very few number of books and secondary sources they were using as influences upon what they were doing. And I thought, that's an all right book, that book sucks. You know, but, but getting lawyers to start thinking about that, you know, and if it's as little as encouraging them to look at book reviews of books put out, but just that has to be more of the strategizing for litigation, okay? Um, if we're also deciding we're trained in the social sciences and humanities and we're being involved in these issues of reconciling Métis issues, is being more at peace with the idea that sometimes the facts pattern in front of us is going to have a really hard road to hoe in the courts. And that's, I've just found in this, you know, the circles I'm part of when it's not the lawyers in the room and talking about that an issue is unjust or really wanting to go forward and going through the court system, that that's where lawyers can be helpful to, you know, find supportive, sympathetic ways of talking about the negative impact a weak facts pattern might have when it's translated into a pretrial and trial system. One of the cases for myself that I think has significant impact on Métis peoples was Mitchell and MNR because it was a case that had, as a quality to it, trade. And I think that case has been echoing numerous times in conversations about the history of Métis peoples, whether it's mentioned or not. But just a decision where, you know, um, the now Chief Justice McLaughlin is, you know, I can, I feel like saying, don't even go there. I mean, and I think she's allowed to go down that road because of some other factors in the story in that in that topic. So we have to, we always have to be alert about being what some historians or social scientists might think is too picky, but again, finding ways to sort of translate the difficulty that our litigation system might put through, uh, put an indigenous story through. Um, I brought up that idea of here's on my to-do list, telling historians that maybe Métis were the first people to do something so that they're not being presidents. I'll, um, I'll uh, say that. that. Um, 
here's the other one I find myself translating about, and um, it sort of is a bit of a not a it's not a sidebar, but a sort of come from my focus on sort of empirical analysis and looking at account books like the same page over 700 times to see if I see trends, is um, when we want to talk about trade and in Métis peoples, as something I'm going to get to this later, like the value of that in law, and I've used that word value, we can talk about the word value. We don't have to just talk about the word money or finances. So when we're trying to notice trade in Métis circles, talking about, it, there might be products, but the value of the exchange. And um, I, I think sometimes, uh, uh, while sort of some nerdy economists I hang out with say, we need, economists need to talk about that more, I don't think there's enough economists that talk out loud about how trade is about value, not just money. Not, you know, and Arthur Ray and, and um, and Frank Tuff as well have been very good about helping us elongate our understanding of what a trading relationship might be. But what we can do is sort of spread it out this way as well too and say in a trading relationship there's things that are of value for that relationship to continue. You know, and we, and we see it in, in um, really good research about kinship now that that's something that's valuable to trade. Um, Here's the other thing on, on my to-do list to work on more that is part of sort of hopefully my project. But here it's where I think we do have this idea of we might be seeming a bit presentist, but we're actually not. Thank you. Is there's three topics I think um, the history of Métis peoples can help with the most in law and we could um, uh, be very influential on how we think of them um, today, but and, and influential upon everyone and really helpful to everyone, is in the role of determining environmental law. I think there's a lot to be said for um, Métis communities such as um, Alacras, having histories where it might not be called environmentalism, but the idea of balance and stability and equipoise, like whatever word is used, but that idea of thinking about land renewal is possible to talk about. And that that can be translated into something that's part of our histories and by gum might be something on our list where we talk about constitutional issues. Mentioned trade already. Trade, I think there's a lot more to be done on trade and the history of trade for indigenous peoples and translate, translating that into modern um, legal conversations about the law but then modern social economic issues. And here's the one I'm really excited about, and it sort of reminds me of how maybe I can combine those two signs together. I think Métis people will be the key to talking about the legal relevance of the phrase sustainable development. Because when parties have been talking about sustainable development, and it's, it's you know, like it's like a really hot, sexy phrase to say, but it's got this idea of using the land properly and thinking about you know, whether it's individual prosperity, but prosperity in some type of circle that creates stability. You know, and prosper prosperity doesn't mean you have to be in the 1%, it means that you can continue on in a stable way. We have many histories of Métis circles who do that, who did that, pardon me. And um, so on, on that note, and I'm, not, I'm trying to see if I, oh, that was just, um, that was John Clark, I found him. He was a person who really had to compromise to local ways, so um, he, he spent most of his professional career trying to convince the Hudson Bay Company that they would never have a monopoly, but somebody else would have a monopoly, and it was the locals. And then this is a guy who, yeah, he, you know, I, when I wrote those things down, I'm like, oh, that sounds like Mel Lastman. But, um, and then this was uh, the uh, Hudson Bay Company plans for the village. Notice 18 buildings in one village. Awesome, eh? And then this is a dude who's like the ladies' man of the town, and he doesn't get anywhere either. But, um, and he's wearing clothes from Montreal. So even if you dress, <laughs> dress like you're from St. Catharines, you're not going to do very well there. Um, I want to sort of end on a note that um, I am very um, always recharged by the idea of thinking about what politics has on the relevance of Métis peoples. Here's where I'd like to sort of go at it a different way um, than um, 
Dr. Chartrand did. I'd like to talk about it at the super local level too. And I'd like us to imagine that um, being political doesn't necessarily mean we need a national capital. It doesn't necessarily mean we have a House of Commons. It might mean that we have locals who are very well organized, have a very long history of determining um, social circumstances that have repercussions and telling the visitors, the outsiders, to shove off. And that that's a moment of politicking too, and that that's a moment of sovereignty. And so we can think of pushing ideas about being political and the importance of seeing that in Métis peoples as a way to um, reaffirm um, you know, um, cultural history and, and ideas of nationhood. But we can go right to one small little place as well too and see it there and then in a sense backdate how we understand that history of politics. And Isle across for me and this peninsula uh, at the Churchill Rivers base has been really helpful for me starting to brainstorm about how to translate those ideas of going to the micro level, noticing sovereignty when a woman knocks on a Hudson Bay Company post door and says, yeah, I'm not going to trade with you anymore, so I'll see you next spring. That that's a very political moment. And um, we can really... Um, um, use those moments of history to really build up our modern conversations about what our role should be in Canadian society today. Anyway, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Sigma. I, uh, I have to say that uh, when I read the description of your presentation, I had no idea what presentist meant. <laughs> and then I decided to do my due diligence and uh, did a bit of research, but unfortunately the definition Siri gave me just did not help. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate you clarifying the importance of the concept um, by, among other things, illustrating how historical local laws can contribute to our contemporary understanding of both sovereignty and treaties. So thank you very much for that. So unfortunately, we started a little bit late, and we do not have that much time for questions, but uh, I think we can probably squeeze in maybe like 17 minutes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, as, as we said before, um, while the input for Brenda McDougall and Mike Evans' uh, project is very, very important, um, we're going to ask that you provide that to them directly or through email um, or via the, the project website that they posted earlier. Um, all the presentations, I believe, will be posted online um, by the Treaty Project. Uh, so, if anybody has some questions for presenters, then uh, I welcome you to ask them now. Thank you to all the presenters. This question is for Robert Innes. Um, within, I appreciate your analysis of, of kinship ties and, and asserting um, a connection between Métis and First Nations people. Um, in my own research, however, I found, well, in explaining my own research, that many settlers don't understand what a Métis identity is or can be or looks like. So I'm curious if there's avenues where we can do both, recognize the similarities between First Nations and Métis peoples, and then also um, sort of locate ourselves in the difference, especially within the context of um, lateral violence. So in some of the communities that I've been, I've seen a lot, and you sort of alluded to what might be some lateral violence among or between Métis and First Nations groups. And I'm curious if you could just expand on those ideas and how we can sort of do both effectively. I think in this circle, we see we'll probably have a pretty good understanding. But in the collective, or like in the, the settler context where I spend most of my time trying to explain like what a Métis identity is, how it can what are some avenues toward that? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I think that, um, uh, <clears throat> I think within uh, the uh, Native community, um, um, I think for uh, many people, 
they have um, they have internalized those divisions, right? And, and certainly, and, and, and to varying degrees, right? I mean, some absolute, some others hardly at all, right? But you know, and generally speaking, you know, we've we've uh, we've uh, internalized the colonial categories that have been imposed on us. So status Indians are status Indians. We're not even Cree. We're not even Kaos as band members. We're status Indians, right? And uh, or or you're we're Métis, and, and if you're if you and if you are Métis, but you have a status card, forget about saying you're Métis, right? So you know, so we've 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 we internalized these these kinds of of um, uh, uh, these ideas that have been imposed on us, and I think that for me, uh, I I would like to see us uh, challenge ourselves to think. Beyond those categories, to try and get rid of those categories, I mean, certainly it, 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 to work against those those categories. You know, now for white people, white people have to start figuring it out for themselves and, and stuff. Uh, and so you have to go wait and tell white people, you know, you know, you know, it's not really. Uh, I don't think that it's it's indigenous people's op, uh, uh, responsibility. Right, necessarily. When, when we, we want to have conversations w with each other, with Canadians, sure, but, uh, but I think that, uh, um, um, that white people have, have, have a responsibility, right? And it sounds like you're trying to do that. And so, I mean, and, and so I would say, you, you, you do what you're doing. You're doing a good job. You got a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> But, but of course, I'm not. I, I'm not saying that Native people shouldn't shouldn't be talking or, or explaining who they are to. But Native people are always doing that, right? It's not as if Native people have never done that before or don't, or don't do that, right? They're always doing that, right? At least that's what I think. So, do we have any more questions for the panelists about uh, the different topics they presented today? Or if you, yeah, great. Say, did that come off angry? Because all of a sudden, got <laughs> he's a very happy guy. <laughs> Hello, uh, Daniel Voth, University of Calgary. Um, my question is actually for, for Brenda. I'm interested in the kind of the long-term trajectory of the uh, of the database. Um, I mean, I think you're very. I, mean, I agree. The 19th century is fabulous, and we should all spend lots of time there. Um, but is there an intention eventually to expand this to additional types of records? I mean, it just seems to me, particularly given the presentation this morning uh, on the 1970s, we've got a ton of information mm -hmm. that's sitting in provincial archives that's just itching to get out. And it's actually very difficult to get to these because it's so desperate. So I'm wondering if there's a long-term trajectory for the plan. Well, the, the long-term plan is, so the, the project itself grew out of the databases that we individually created, the, the four of us, um, over time. Um, and it was just a place to start, um, just to start experimenting, to start building a platform, to seeing what's possible. Um, but absolutely, at the, the whole design is to include other databases. So if somebody um, like Natalie is working um, on that 20th century uh, topic and is databasing information, we're not making the original records available. Um, we are absolutely creating links so, or uh, sourcing information so that you can track down the original document. Um, that's built into the into the structure. Um, but if if anybody is databasing 20th century documents, such as yourself, we absolutely want to add you in. So there's no I, there's no um, time limit to the to the process, um, and it is built to be. Um, uh, added to uh, by whatever relevant documentation comes across our way. Yeah, absolutely. We're not close to that possibility. But I'm not going to do 20th century research. I got enough going on in the 19th. <laughs> it was long enough. Was yeah, it? yeah. I got 100 years to work with already. So. Great. Well, if we don't have any more questions, the oh great, oh great. We got a couple. Uh, it's not so much a, a question, my Tony Belcourt. It's not so much a question; it's a comment. Um, had uh, breakfast with my wonderful daughter Christy uh, a couple of days ago, 
and uh, we're talking about uh, launching a new discussion about um, about uh, self-government, Métis self-government. And, uh, you know, young people today uh, are a really critical source of uh, information about uh, the narrative of Métisness and community. Um, <coughs> Christy is pretty fed up, I would say, with, uh, and so am I, with the various kinds of ways that we are categorized. Um, some of us are categorized in an individual way, and others are categorized in a community kind of way. Um, and uh, a lot of us are concerned about where we go in the future in terms of uh, uh, what's going to be unraveling or, unde or developing and so on with regard to uh, the implementation of our right of self-determination. <coughs> and, and I think one of the issues Christy has raised, which is really a personal one, uh, she said, you know, Dad, what about my daughter, my granddaughter, Gina? Her dad's a status Indian. So she becomes a status Indian legally, but she's a Métis. What about her? Where does she fit in in all of this? And really, that's our discussion. Uh, we need to have that kind of a discussion. I know lots of young people are, are troubled by this kind of thing. Um, we're, we're, we appear to be pigeonholed um, and uh, I think this whole business about maintenance and, and, uh, and community is, uh, is something where we need to reach out to young people to get their thoughts on it and their ideas because they have a lot uh, going through their minds and they have a fresh look and a fresh approach to all of this. And it's not based on legalese. Well, that's important, I suppose, in certain, for certain purposes. Uh, but for the purposes of relationships within our communities, that's critical. I just wanted to offer those comments. On, because I know if Christy was here, she'd want me to say those things. Mm -hmm. She'd want to say those things. Thanks. And I think we have time for one more question. There was uh, somebody else who had raised their hand. No? Okay. Well, then we'll finish on time. Um, and did you want to say something, Larry? Yeah, go ahead okay. <laughs> Getting to the gifts, the good stuff. So I'm very pleased to uh, present to our panelists on behalf of the organizers of the conference a book called Gabriel, Gabriel, sorry, Dumont, um, and it's images and in words. So I am pleased to present one of these to each of you. It's really heavy, um, so obviously good reading. Um, and thank you all for joining us today, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of you at the conference. Thank you.